visitors, backsliders, young and old alike, that they like the whole idea of being at the apostolic church. They like the whole idea of the good feeling when we worship. They like the good feeling when they lift their hands up and feel the presence of the Lord. They like the, the whole experience. They like it. I like it. I like it. But there are many people. I have a video at home, and I, I, I'll, I'll be happy to share it with you if you just remember where you got it. But I have a documentary at home of the, uh, of, of the uh, 100 year celebration of Jesus' name baptism. And, and it, it goes back, it, it's really neat, it goes back from 325 A.D. with Constantine and, and all, all the way up through uh, the 1913 when Jesus' name baptism was once again uh, revealed in this latter rain revival outpouring. Uh, and, and I noticed that when you see a picture of uh, a great big group in the city, Brother Pete, that you couldn't really tell by looking the church folks and the regular folks. When I say regular folks, I mean those that didn't go to church. Sister Eloise, everybody dressed the same back then. We're talking... The, 1906, 1908, 1913, 100 years, all right? And I begin, it was like a, a big, and I prayed about it this morning, and, and please don't think that I'm going to quit preaching on holiness because I'm not. I believe it's, it's essential. Brother David, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That's pretty plain. But there are many people that holiness is their hang-up in living for God. If I could look like the world, act like the world, keep doing the fun things in the world I want to, and still be saved, I'd do it. Right? But I am going to ask you a question that you're free to ask them. With them is the folks that really would like to be apostolic. Is being like the world worth going to hell over? Say, oh, you're not supposed to talk like that. You're not supposed to judge people. If you feel a desire, if you feel a need, if you feel drawn to the power of the Holy Ghost, and it's a part of the world system that stops you from doing that, that in itself ought to tell you the importance of being different from the world. The reason why, Marcus, the reason why that I know it's so important is because it's such a big deal to us. Now, this lesson this morning, I, I wrestled a little bit not going to get done at all, and then uh, I, I wrestled a little bit with it because it's something that I preach so much, and something that I teach so much, and I am aware that sometimes people get a little bit, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a little bit uh, jittery, a little bit uh, we've heard that, so they shut you off. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, I, I, I've heard that before. But Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous to repentance, but the sinner. If we're not careful, Brother McKinney, we will become so consumed with preaching and teaching things for the saints that we forget about the people that are really hungry for God and need the Holy Ghost because if you're not born of the water and the Spirit, your chances of making it to heaven ain't very good. So, if you'll please indulge me, as the Apostle Paul said, bear with me in my folly. Indulge me just a little bit. 
because I don't want the devil to be able to get a foothold in our church. So I'm going to preach and teach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ until he comes. Because it's still not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It is still the infilling of the Holy Ghost that changes a life. It is still the infilling of the Holy Ghost that allows us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It is the power of the Holy Ghost that takes somebody from the guttermost to the uttermost, if you will. It is the power of the Holy Ghost. With, without the Holy Ghost, I'm not preaching in a church, but I'm just in a social club. It's the Holy Ghost that changes us from just a gathering to a power-packed potential for worldwide revival. When you see the ability of the Holy Ghost, see what the Spirit of God can do when people quit worrying about the world and start pursuing Jesus. Acts 2 and 37. How many can quote it? A couple, three, four, five. Now when they heard this, they heard Peter preach the message. From Acts chapter number 2, verse number 14, to Acts chapter number 2 and verse 36, when he says, And God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. I, I got to let you know something. That's still happening today. People's hearts are still pricked with conviction. And please, please, I don't go to looking around and everything, but I've seen not one, not two, not three, not four, but several people sit on our pews in the last few services and weep under the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. I've seen it happening. I've seen people moved by the power of the Holy Ghost, Brother Pete. People are interested in the power of the Holy Ghost. And when they... Be when they become, begin to become interested in the power of the Holy Ghost, then the devil sets up and takes notice, Brother Billy, and he begins to try to put everything in their path that he can. He begins to try to cause them problems and cause them difficulties and discourage them. It is then our responsibility when they come into the house of the Lord for us to praise God in the dance, to praise Him with our hands lifted up, to sing loud the Psalms of Zion, to worship the Lord in spirit and truth because once again we are affirming and reaffirming that the power of the Holy Ghost is real. They were pricked in their heart. The devil has made us believe conviction don't fall anymore. Right? How many of you have thought that in your mind? Huh? Come on, stay with me now. I, I believe that's a lie. Conviction does still fall. It does still fall. And the hindrance to people come running to the altar ain't the devil. It ain't hell. But it's sanctified Holy Ghost filled people that will not respond to the power of the Holy Ghost the way that you used to the way that you used to respond to the Holy Ghost. There's something inside of me, Brother Pete, that I can't sit still if I want to. If I get aggravated or agitated and come to the house of God, Brother Rice, it don't take but a couple of hands raised, a couple of clapping. It don't take but while I'm tying my tie and I'm thinking uh, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love. He wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus. It's the Holy Ghost. It's what, 
It's what Paul meant when he told Timothy. He said, I know there's a lot of junk going on in your life, but here's the solution. Stir up the gift that is within you. Stir up the gift that is within you. How do you stir up the gift? You clap your hands. You lift your hands. You move your feet. You sing. You sing of his wonderful goodness and his mercy and his power and of his amazing grace. And if you don't, you watch what happens we used to sing a little song, talk about it's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. We got to let the Holy Ghost begin to flow. We got to let it flow. I heard Sister Freeman prophesy that the problem with the church in the day that we live is that we've quenched the flow. We're not letting the Holy Ghost flow through us. We want to soak it and soak it and soak it and soak it, but we're not letting it flow through us. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The introduction of New Testament salvation to the entire world began with this question. The answer would be revealed to the ultimate question, which is, what must I do to be saved? Salvation is defined as deliverance. Everybody say deliverance. That word just sounds good. I like it. Deliverance from all the power and effects of sin. Now when we say sin, immediately our mind will go to different individual things. Right? We think about can't do this and can't do this and can't do this and can't do this and can't do this. That's not what this is necessarily talking about here. It's not talking about a particular sin, but it's dealing with why do I want to sin. It's dealing with the motivation and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life, the things that would draw me to things that are ungodly or unholy or immoral. It's a decision that we make. But salvation delivers you from all the power and the effects. The effect is you doing it. The power is what draws you. Can I get a witness? It draws us. Brother David, it's the power of sin that draws us. It's not an individual act. It's not an individual act, but it's the power of the world system and the God of this world drawing us. But I come to tell you that there is a deliverance from that. There is a way out. And salvation is by grace through faith. We can do no good thing to save ourselves. No amount of good works we do. You can't give away enough money. You can't give enough people, enough hitchhikers a ride. You can't give enough groceries away. You can't give enough Christmas presents away. You cannot do enough good things for people to be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and through 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The atoning work of Jesus Christ, which is the death, burial, and his resurrection. It made salvation available, and the only way to receive it is by believing in Jesus Christ and that his sacrifice is sufficient or enough for you. Don't matter what kind of sin you've committed. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how ugly people think about you. It doesn't matter the truth, the lie, the reputation. It doesn't matter. If you've sinned, even big sins, the blood of Jesus can wash them away and you hear me right now, you have got to believe it. If you don't believe it, I can't help you. If you don't believe that the cross is good for you, I can't help you. As try as I may, I, I want to. I, I want to try to convince you. But all I can do is tell you Jesus died for you in your place and he shed his blood to wash your sins away and you've got to believe that 
I didn't say you had to understand it. I didn't say you had to grasp a hold of all the nuances of it, but you got to believe it. You got to believe it. Believe that Jesus loved you that much. Romans 3, 24 through 28 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word justified means proven to be right. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. Well, that's a $100 word, isn't it? Propitiation. Jesus Christ came to be the propitiation of our sins. That word propitiation means to do away with the power of sin and the judgment that sin carries. What was the judgment of sin? Death. Separation. Kicked out of the garden. Kicked out of the presence of the Lord. And you shall surely die. Salvation is deliverance from that. God sent Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ rolled himself in the likeness of sinful flesh and came to do away with the power that sin had. But here's how it's done. Through faith in his blood. Through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God. That word forbearance means to hold back. Brother Pete, we are doomed when we sin. Sin brings death. But the forbearance of God, the grace of God, held back judgment. How long does he hold it back? Two things. Until Jesus comes or until you believe in the power of the cross. He holds back. The judgment that we deserve. He holds it back. Just hoping that today's the day when you'll say, I believe that. I believe that. I believe it. Through the forbearance, holding back. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. Please see the refrain. It's his righteousness he declared. It's not ours. We cannot be righteous in ourselves. We can only be righteous through him. Through accepting the price that he paid. Which was the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. There's no room to boast. By what law of works? Those are, are uh, uh, rhetorical questions. It's not the law of Moses. It's not the works of goodness, but it's the law of faith. That we conclude thereby that a man is justified without the deeds of the law. Stop thinking that you've got to do all of this stuff before God will save your soul. Stop thinking that there's a list of rules that as you check them off, when you get to the bottom, then the Lord will say you're worth saving. You cannot be saved through being good. You cannot be saved through following a list of rules. And I believe holiness standards are essential. The crazier the world gets, the stronger we've got to preach it. But please understand, you don't have to be righteous to be saved. That's what we need to be saved from. Thou shalt bring forth the Son and call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Grace works through faith. And to believe on Jesus includes believing his word 
And truly believing includes obedience. Faith is more than a profession of belief. It must be accompanied by trust that is brought to life through a commitment to pursue God and His benefits. It is impossible to separate saving faith from obedience. Acts 6 and 7. And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. How are you obedient to the faith? How are you? What is the faith? What is the faith you got to have? Come on, stay with me just a minute. Y'all, I just told it to you. You got to have faith in the power of the cross and that it was for you. You got to have faith. How are you obedient to the faith? The, the, the religious world doesn't use this scripture. They don't like, they, you just got to believe. You got to believe. You got to be obedient to the faith. My God. Romans 1 and 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. I just got to stop here. And don't, you don't have to go there, Brother Shannon. But Ephesians 4 and 4 says what? One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God who is the Father of all, above all, through all, and in you all. For obedience to the faith. What faith? The faith that is through Jesus Christ. The faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many people stop. We've got to have the whole plan, the whole thing. It wasn't enough, Brother Terry, to just die. It wasn't enough just to be buried. But you've got to have the power of the resurrection. And you've got to believe in it. You've got to believe in it. Romans 10 and 16. Uh-oh. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, that's Isaiah, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Listen to me right now. The Lord will not, he will not come and shake you and tell you, you're going to be saved whether you believe it or not. You've got to believe. Uh, we do not discount the power of faith and the power of believing. But there will be some who will not obey the gospel. Obedience to God's word is necessary for salvation. John 14 and 15 says, Brother Billy and Brother Pete, I think, Brother David, we just used it. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now lest you think that that gives a, a credence to more than one God, John 10 and 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. All that does go to say that Jesus and God are both the Holy Ghost. Romans 6 and 17. But God be thanked. Let me tell you something. I, mean, I, I, I don't know how in the world that we're, I don't know, we're tired or something. I don't know. I was expecting another blowout, Brother Billy. But Brother Rice, I am amazed at how clear, Brother Robbie, that the gospel of Jesus Christ really is. But that ought to tell us 
how powerful the blinding effects of the God of this world are. But I can't be intimidated because the Bible says greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So you all have got to let your faith out as I preach this and realize that there's no power greater than the power of the Holy Ghost. No power. No power. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form, that word form there means representation or pattern. That form of doctrine which was delivered you. You got to obey. You got to do it from the heart. Hebrews 5 and 9. And being made perfect, he became the author, talking about Jesus Christ. The author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't preach eternal security. I don't believe once saved, always saved. But I do believe there's hope in that, Brother Rice. I preach that there's hope to stay saved. And the Bible well, I'll tell you what, I'm having a hard time staying calm, cool, and collected. I just feel the Holy Ghost running all up and down my spine. Eternal salvation. This ain't something I got for while I'm going through a stage. This ain't something I got till I get my kids grown or I get to be my own boss. But this is something that I got and it got me and I plan on it being that way through all eternity. Eternal salvation. That means uh, that through the power of the blood of Jesus, that sin will never reign over me. The only way sin has any power or authority over me is if I open up my arms and say, come get you son. But if I crucify the flesh with its affections and its lust, I can be saved forever. I can just step over like we heard Brother Bear say one time. I'll say, Halle here and Lou you there. I'll just step straight over from walking with the Lord to kneeling at his feet. I'll step straight over from worshiping with you to worshiping at the throne of the King of Kings. I will step over from New Madrid, Missouri to walking on streets of gold. I will be with the Lord for eternity. I still believe in heaven, Brother McKinney. I still believe in eternal life. I still believe that through the power of the death, burial, and resurrection that I can be saved, not just for today, but for eternity. Amen. Clap your hands unto the Lord. Come on. Praise God. Like the old lady said, Brother Pete, my, 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 I feel the Holy Ghost up in this place. Brother Rice, it's real. I can't conjure it up. I'm not that good a speaker. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the Spirit of God Almighty. I prayed this morning. I walked by and prayed for every pew. I prayed for the doors. I prayed for the instruments, Brother Billy. I prayed for us just to be aware. For us to be aware that God Almighty, Brother David, when I consider all of his creation, what is me that he's mindful of me? And he visited me. <laughs> what is man? I don't know. I can't describe it. I can't tell you what makes me so special to him. But I know he loves me. He loves me so much, Brother Chris, he died for me. He 
died for me. He shed his blood, and I'm going to believe that. Yeah. You want to know how I'm going to believe it? Because I've carried the guilt, the load of sin. Yeah. I've carried the guilt and the load of bad decisions and of stupid mistakes. Yeah. But then you know what? Yeah. I felt him lift it off of me. I felt the blood working again, Brother Pete. I felt the blood washing me, as David said, whiter than snow. Because there ain't nothing in the world that can compare to the cleanness, to the purity of the blood of Jesus Christ washing you. Can't say it's white as snow, it's whiter than snow. So it's just not peace, it's peace that passeth understanding. To all them that obey him. And I got to keep coming back to that. <laughs> oh, I, I got to bring this up again. Can you imagine the excitement, Brother McKinney, that Jesus Christ felt when he got to go back to Nazareth? As he's walking down the streets of Nazareth, Brother Terry, and he's, think, he, he's thinking, oh, I can't wait to get to Sally's house. Because I remember she's been, been lame in her feet. All of my years coming up, I can't wait to go heal her. I can't wait to go to Billy Bob's house because I know he was an alcoholic and I can't wait to go set him free. I can't wait to go to, to Blind Buddy's house because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean his eyes up and he's going to be healed. These are my people I love. I grew up among them. This was my home. This was my family. It's dear to me. But the Bible says he left Nazareth having done no great work there for one reason. They would not believe. Don't underestimate your power to believe. They would not believe. Can you imagine the sorrow, the disappointment? Because as powerful as he is, he, he cannot make you believe. Isaiah chapter number 5. You might write this down to read it when you get home. He said, I sing to my well-beloved a song of the vineyard. And then he goes right down there to say, Brother Chris, what more could I have done? What more, what more can he do? He paid it all. Say, no, I think you're preaching each easy believism. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But it all begins with faith. It all begins with believing. It begins with believing. Faith is made alive only through our response to the word and the action taken to fulfill it. Because, I, and I'm not going to read all of this, but James chapter number 2, verse number 14 through 26 says that faith without works is dead. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. If you don't do something about your believing, your faith is dead. It's dead. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, you might say, well, that contradicts what you said earlier. By faith are you saved. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, absolutely. But this scripture goes on to tell us if your buddy is cold, if he's naked, it does no good for you to tell him go and be warm. Right? Go and be warm. No, the Bible says you have faith through your action of taking your coat and putting it around him. And then, if I can just get the coat on him. That's all I'm trying to do, Brother Pete. If I, if I just let them get the coat on, they'll be warm. They'll be warm. What does it profit them if you don't give them what they need? So if I get up here and preach, believe, 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 and that's it. I haven't given you what you need in order for you to obey, for you to take unto you the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Saving faith is acceptance of the gospel as the sole means of salvation. And saving faith is obedience to the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is his death. Because you see, Brother McKinney, the death plays a role in itself. The death is the sacrifice. The death was the sacrifice of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Because the Bible says, oh Lord, have mercy. I may need to pray for the Lord to hold back the clock. Oh, there ain't no clock. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The death, it plays a role. It's not just leading us. In a manner of speaking, Brother David, the death, the burial, and the resurrection all stand alone with a significance. The death of Jesus Christ was so we don't have to die. Now understand, it's not talking about our fleshly body. Okay, but it's talking about the hope of eternal life. The death was the sacrifice. The burial was to fulfill the time obligation. The burial was to follow the death. The burial, though it was in a borrowed tomb, the burial was of necessity for the death to be covered. The burial... Without the burial, there was not going to be a resurrection. The death, how are we in the likeness of his death? And I know I'm skipping a bunch of stuff here, but I've got to get to it. What is the likeness of his death? It's repentance. Which, please forgive me. Forgive me if I'm being redundant. But repentance is so much deeper than saying, I'm sorry. But Brother McCain, the Bible said, godly sorrow worketh repentance. The burial is water baptism in Jesus' name. And the resurrection is receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Repentance and water baptism involve dying and burying the old man. And it obliterates the record of past sins and judgment that sin brings. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the rebirth. It is the resurrection. He didn't stay dead. He didn't stay buried. Acts 2.37, they said, let's stand. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That was the question that was asked. You'll stay with me just a minute. I think I'm even having you stand about a couple minutes early. <laughs> Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the plan of salvation. This is the answer to what do I do? What do I do? Repent. That's the first. Repent. And be baptized. I love it. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But then in Acts chapter number 8, it happened again. A 
a great revival in Samaria. They repented. They were baptized. Then they called the apostles, Peter and John, to come. And when they laid hands on them, they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And crazy old Simon saw them get the Holy Ghost. You cannot see believing. Brother David, it's intangible. Just that, that desire, that, that believing, a mental decision to believe, nobody can see it. But he saw him, Brother Billy, and it messed with him so much he tried to buy that power. Tried to buy that power. But then in Acts chapter number 10, excuse me, Acts chapter number 9, verse 17 and 18, in Acts 22, 16, the apostle Paul was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he was baptized in Jesus' name. Then in Corinthians, he tells us, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. In Acts chapter number 10, a good man, Brother Chris, a good man. He prayed to God always and gave much alms to the people. He prayed so much an angel came down from heaven. And the angel had a simple message, go find Peter. He'll tell you what to do. I preached about it last Sunday night while Peter yet spake these words. The Holy Ghost fell on them. And the Gentile, I mean, the Jews that were there were amazed because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter said, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Ghost as well as we and the Bible said, Brother Billy, then they baptized them in the name of the Lord. And in Acts chapter number 19, 12 more good men. Paul runs into 12 disciples of John the Baptist. It says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we hadn't heard nothing about the Holy Ghost. He said, well, then how were you baptized? They said, under John's baptism. And then Paul said, remember what John said. I baptize you with water unto repentance. But there's one coming after me that's mightier than I. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And the Bible said when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus and they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I want to say something to the saints of God. If I ever preach or anyone else ever preaches or teaches the doctrine of the apostles and the prophets, the doctrine of Jesus Christ for salvation, and you find yourself getting bored, you better be the first one in the altar. Because if you don't love the gospel, you fell out of love with the Lord. Brother Rice, there better be nothing excite us more than when somebody preaches the death, burial, and resurrection. Because all these good services and all these other things that we talk about and all the pumping and priming and juking and jiving we do, you can go to heaven without that. You can't be saved without the death, burial, and resurrection. I pray you'll let the Holy Ghost prick your heart today. There's nothing like it in all the world. There's no feeling. There's no friendship. No relationship that can supersede the relationship you can have with the Lord. All you got to do is believe. And if you truly believe from the heart, you'll obey not me. Brother David, this ain't my gospel. But it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's lift up our hands and praise the Lord for this great gospel.